Ephesians 3, 1, for this cause, okay, for this reason, everything that Paul talked about in Ephesians 2, Jew and Gentile becoming one. I, Paul, Paul's addressing himself, the prisoner of Jesus Christ. So he was in, he's in prison when he's writing this epistle of Ephesians. So he was in house prison that time. For some of you who know the story of the Apostle Paul, at Acts chapter 28, he was imprisoned inside the home that time. All right. <clears throat> For you Gentiles, so Paul, as a prisoner of Jesus Christ, he was ministering to us Gentiles about what? If ye have heard, what did you hear? Of the dispensation of the grace of God. Okay, whatever that means for now. This dispensation of God's grace, the Gentiles heard about it, which is given me to you word. So this dispensation of the grace of God was given to Paul, and then he gave it to you word. All right, what does you word mean? It's an it's a easier way to say towards you. So if you don't want to say towards you, because that's just too many syllables, too many words, then just say you word, all right? So that's the idea, towards you. Now, Paul, he received this uh, dispensation of the grace of God, and then he gave it to us Gentiles. Now we come across another problem. Guess what? We go back to the hyper-dispensationalists again. For some weird reason, these verses are very rich against mid acts doctrine, even though this epistle is one of their favorite epistles. You'll notice over here, let's cover the first. So, the hyper-dispensationalists, they claim this. When you look at verse 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, they claim that the Apostle Paul, was, he received the dispensation of the grace of God. Dispensation of grace. Hence, since Paul received this, that's why we were able to hear about salvation by grace, not by works. So that's what hyper-dispensationalists will argue. So it began with Paul. It can only begin with Paul. It never was before Paul. That's what they keep, that's what they keep insisting. So Paul supposedly received this salvation by grace, this dispensation of grace. You see this dividing line? So with this, this dividing line, hence started the dispensation of the church, they'll argue. So they're thinking about a timeline when they say dispensation. This began the dispensation, the timeline of the church and salvation by grace through Paul. It began with Paul. It never was before Paul. Now, there are certain problems with this, all right? The, the several weaknesses to this argument is, number one, you'll notice that if they claim that verse 2 and 3 is the salvation gospel of Paul, Okay, don't take it back then, all right? If you men acts, believe in that, don't take it back. If you strongly believe in that, verse 2 and 3, look at verse 1. For this cause. Wait a minute. So in verse 1, Paul says, for this cause. Okay, this reason that I'm preaching this salvation by grace, that's only to the Christian church. It has nothing to do with Jew, all right? He says that. But he starts out, so that's the context of verse 1 here, right? What's he referring to for this cause? That means for this very reason, right? For this very reason what? Verse 22 and more behind. Isn't that how you start off in a, a English, uh, uh, grammatically speaking, in a correct way? Paul says, let's look at this example. Verse 22 of Ephesians 2. In whom ye also are builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. For this cause. See, based on that reason on verse 22 and the others behind, I, Paul, yada, yada, yada. Wow, then verse 22, 21, 20, 19, 18, 17, all the way to verse 13, where Paul says that Jews and Gentiles became one in the body of Christ. For that very reason, Paul preached about the dispensation of the grace of God. Wow, mid-Acts won't like that. So this becomes a powerful argument against mid-Acts because if they insist 2-3 is talking about Paul's gospel and it has nothing to do with the Jews, none whatsoever, then tell them to not take it back and then tell them to look at the context of verse 1 for this cause. 
For the very reason of what? Verse 22, 21, 20, 19, 18, 17, 16 at chapter 2. <laughs> Which is talking about what we talked about earlier. Jews and Gentiles. Jews. It had to do with Jews. It had to do with Jews whether you like it or not. All right. Here's the second issue with the mid-Acts argument. If you keep reading at verse uh, 2 and... Uh, let's look at verse 3 now. So this dispensation of grace, whatever that is that Paul received... It's by revelation. How that by revelation? So God revealed it to him. It's through that revelation. He made known unto me the mystery. God made known to Paul that mystery. As I wrote a four in a few words. So Paul received this mystery, which, was not, which means that it was not known before. So it was not revealed before. Okay, that's important to understand. Not revealed before. It had to start out with Paul, see? It wasn't revealed before Paul. This is crux to the mid-Acts argument. So because it was a mystery, Paul's the one who revealed the mystery, and everyone else before Paul didn't know about it. So you can't argue body of Christ started before Paul. You can't argue that there were elements of the gospel of salvation by grace, not by works, was before Paul. That's how mid-Acts claim and teach. Now, there are several, uh, there's more weaknesses to this argument. This is very rich. This is a, one of the favorite mid-Acts texts, yet it becomes the biggest thorn on their side. One of the powerful texts against mid-Acts. Because, first of all, Let's define dispensation of the grace of God. If you look up in a dictionary, dispensation, it does not mean a time period. That's important to understand. Dispensation, it's like a dispenser that dispenses things. So it's administering things uh, to, uh, differently. That's where we get dispensationalism from. We can include people and time period here. If you look at Webster's 1828 dictionary, it includes time period, it includes persons, but it does not solely mean time period. When you solely think time period, then you're going to come out like a mid axe. But if you think like administering differently, giving out, then that makes sense. Because if you think that way, dispensation, if God administers, it's a giving of what? God's grace. To Paul. Why? Because, keep reading verse 2, is given me. There's your answer. It's given to Paul. Let's keep reading the context here. Look at verse 7. Wherefore I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me. Look at that. It was gifted to him. It was given to him. Why? Because God dispensed it to Paul. It's not God time period it to Paul, all right? Uh, this is even more powerful. Look at verse 8. Unto me, who am less than the least of all saints, is this grace given, all right? So he was given that grace. Now, here's another problem. Another problem is when God talks about, so there, they have a fallacy with this first definition, dispensation. But it gets worse for them. They have a fallacy with this second definition, grace. Simply, what does grace mean? Jesus died, buried, resurrected. No, that's not what grace means. Jesus Christ, when he died, buried, and resurrected, it was an act of grace. But that's not what grace means. Grace simply means that something we don't deserve, yet we get it. See, we don't deserve Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, but Jesus did it anyway. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. So see, uh, you notice the mid acts problem? They're not as deep or intelligent as you think. They're very amateurish. Yes, it, it can be time period for here. Yes, it can be Jesus, death, birth, resurrection here. But that's not the sole meaning. That's not the definition. These are things that are included in here. Now, grace, it's something that we don't deserve, yet we get it. So what did... God give to Paul. Well, this is a big problem now. If you look at the context, we see at verse 7, it's a gift. It's a gift. See that? Verse 8, Paul says, Unto me who am less than the least of all saints. Look at that. The whole idea and meaning here is that, man, God gave me something I don't deserve. Yeah. 
It has nothing to do with the death, burial, and resurrection. But look at further, uh, further context from Scripture with Scripture. 2 Corinthians 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Let's look at more context here. Scripture with Scripture. As Martin Luther once said, sola scriptura. And now I want you to go to Galatians 2. Galatians 2. We're going to look at 2 Corinthians chapter 12. And then we're also going to turn to Galatians chapter 2. This is a problem here. Because the grace that Paul received, you're going to find out it did not begin at Ephesians like the mid-Acts want to argue. It actually happened long before. I mean, the probably the clearest one would be Acts 15 over here. It, wasn't, it didn't happen at Ephesians. Some people will argue, well, this happened at Ephesians, but look at this one. It can go as clear back as Acts 15, because take a look at this. Look at this. It's not a salvation by grace, not by works, Jesus' death, burial, resurrection, that you think what, what Paul means by grace here. Because look at this, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7. And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the what? Revelations. Uh, remember Ephesians 3? Paul received this revealing from God, and God gave him grace. Keep reading. Verse 9, And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Why, that's God giving Paul grace to carry on the revelations. It's not that God gave him salvation to Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. No, because at verse 9, Paul was talking about his sickness, his infirmity. So God had to give him grace to carry on the revelations that God has given to Paul. Wow. Now look at Galatians 2. This becomes a further problem. Galatians 2. Galatians chapter 2, and then notice what Paul mentions at verse 2. And I went up by what? Revelation. And it communicated unto them that gospel which I preach among the Gentiles, but privately to them which were of reputation, lest by any means I should run or had run in vain. So who is he speaking to? He is speaking to John, James, and Peter. At verse, uh, let's see, verse 9. And when James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillars, see, they heard that. Why? Why? When did this happen? Uh, at Ephesians? No way. Not even the mid-Acts will go for that. Wow. They know that that meeting Paul had with James, John, and Peter was Acts 15. So this is what happened in Acts 15. But look at this. Perceive the what? Grace that was given unto me. Look at that. God's grace that was given to Paul. All right, now let's go to Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians 3. So let's even say that Galatians 2, that the grace that uh, God gave to Paul over here was referring to salvation uh, of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ at Galatians 2. Let's even suppose that at Galatians 2. It doesn't change the fact that it was before the book of Ephesians. Then they'll have to admit that, that the death, burial, resurrection of Christ, salvation by grace, not by works, was before Ephesians. <laughs> then they'll have to argue that. All right, now let's go to Ephesians chapter 3. We're going to go to Ephesians chapter 3. And then uh, let's finish it off right over here. The last part that I want to show what is wrong with their argument is this mystery, right? So it was not revealed before, uh, it was not revealed before Paul. That's what the mid-Acts keep arguing. But there are two problems here, not just one, there are two. One, sure, Paul may, let's even say it was revealed clearly to Paul, all right? Didn't you know God can still do salvation by grace, not by works, uh, and keep it hidden, but keep it operating? So it was operating, but it wasn't revealed clearly. You ever thought about that option? They never thought about that option. I mean, uh, think about these people who got saved by grace, not by works. You got a problem here. One, you got to think about, what about the thief on the cross? You think he was saved by the Old Testament Jewish law of works? 
<laughs> what about Acts chapter 8, the Ethiopian eunuch? Before he got baptized, what did he do? He believed on Christ for salvation, not by works. How about that? So you can't argue against those things. Another thing is this, is that the second argument is the mystery is not referring to salvation by grace, not by works. The mystery is verse 6, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body. Basic, the mystery was Gentiles get to join the Jews over here. That's the mystery. Not the death, burial, resurrection of Christ, salvation by grace, not by works. Well, that was not the case over here. It was that the Gentiles can join the Jews. Yes. All right, so Amen. we will continue to uh, show the errors of the mid acts group and some of those uh, mid acts trolls who are watching me online. <laughs> I hope, uh, get ready for more. And I hope that the Lord can change your hearts.